welcome back to the Thinking Progressive podcast. I'm your host, Ron Rivers, and in this episode, we're going to be exploring a form of utopia that is most available to humanity in our present day. Throughout history, societies have evolved over time thanks to the collective knowledge and efforts of those that came before us. Today, we're witnessing the end of a dying ethos, one that has concentrated the productive and capital power in the hands of an incredibly small minority. Late stage capitalism is the greatest threat to our planet, but we can't seem to let go of it. I believe that's because we don't really have a true alternative just yet. In this second episode of our series about utopias, we're going to explore what the next evolution could be. We'll talk broadly about systems, institutions, and cultural drivers that shape the people who inhabit these societies. As you settle into this episode, I ask you to clear your mind of any doubt you're having about utopias going into this, because everything I'm going to discuss is very possible today. We don't need to wait for a better world. We just need to give it form and then act to make it real. Thank you for listening to the Thinking Progressive Podcast. If you were to imagine the first steps towards crafting a utopia on Earth, what would they look like? Assuming our point of departure is this very moment in time, right now you're listening to this, this is our starting point. We'd have to keep our ideas radical in their potential, but not too far beyond the immediate moment so they would become considered unrealistic. That means living in the Star Trek universe is out, which is a real bummer, but building a society that is significantly more advanced in both institution and collective ethos is in. Any attempt at organizing society begins by setting a framework for our efforts. Utopian societies will take form through evolutionary stages, much like uh, human history to date, and rudimentary being the first stage of utopia and our focus of the moment. Rudimentary utopia begins in a culture very much like ours today, with technological ascendancy powering the possibility of a new way of thinking and being within the world. We can imagine that they would take root in two possible scenarios. Um, After a significant crisis, like, for example, the climate crisis uh, or war, or through the collective efforts of a population supporting a transcendence. We can imagine that they would take root in two possible scenarios. Uh, After a significant crisis, like the climate crisis or war, or through the collective efforts of a population. The point of thinking through ideas about the next era of humanity is to give us a foundation to work off of. The underlying theme that permeates all aspects of a society undergoing the process of becoming a rudimentary utopia is that change changes. There is a wholesale rejection of stagnant institutions, leadership, and ways of thinking. We let go of the isolationist principles guiding us since we invented primitive agriculture instead reviving the cooperative and egalitarian nature of our species. Rudimentary utopias are societies where individual survival is no longer dependent on labor. Automation technology has advanced to a point where the majority of repetitive tasks are automated. The productive benefits of these collective advancements are shared with society. These arrangements allow for new approaches towards labor, Uh, and they better support the individual's opportunity to explore and innovate in the directions of their choice. Now, this is a stark contrast to the world we live in today, where the most advanced technologies are really isolated in the hands of a few firms, um, which is really unfortunate because if you compare history, for example, to like the Industrial Revolution, Um, If you wanted to open a loom shop in the Industrial Revolution, you had access to the most advanced loom designs. You just needed the capital and the people. Uh, Today, the most advanced loom designs, quote unquote, are are in the hands of these monolith corporations like Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, and and they have technology that the average person has no access to. 
Um, so utopias break apart that. They extend access to the most advanced forms of technology to everyone. Um, because the idea is we build ourselves a better floor to work from. Uh, instead of having the highest floor concentrated in specific areas and other people working off a much lower starting point. A minimum requirement for rudimentary utopias would be a collection of national social programs removing burdens and barriers from a population. Burdens are survival related, right? So like food, water, housing, and healthcare would fall under varying degrees of public ownership. Barriers are structures preventing us from being better than we are at really any given moment. So education, transportation, information, and communication, um, they are, all of those verticals also fall under a shared ownership model. Rudimentary utopias approach these industry verticals through the mindset of scaled efficiencies. And the idea is pretty simple, right? So collectively investing in the research and development of these programs expands our power to improve them consistently. Public ownership can take a variety of forms. Utopias are not limited to the type of closed economies that the earth operates under today. So for example, what do I mean by a closed economy? Well, capitalism has very specific rules to capitalism. Socialism has very specific rules to socialism. Communism uh, has very specific rules to communism, right? So forth and so on. But worries and debates about capitalism, socialism, and other modes of production are not relevant concerns of a utopian society. Because participants consider each productive vertical, right? And what I mean by that is um, food, uh, agriculture is a vertical, transportation is a vertical. Um, they consider them as separate and unique challenges that they are. And they form new laws of property and contract for different market verticals that all operate side by side. Now we'll expand deeper into those eight uh, categories that we identified. Rudimentary utopias would classify water extraction and distribution as a total public ownership model. Human utopias all recognize that water is an absolute necessity for well-being. From our present perspective, water is becoming increasingly scarce due to the climate crisis. Combined with the privatization of the resources, we are setting ourselves up for some very dystopian times. Utopias manage water through collaborative efforts and innovations under the complete ownership of the public. They use scaled efficiencies to pursue advancements in water extraction and creation technologies uh, through private and public initiatives. Food management in rudimentary utopias occurs pretty similarly to water. Participants recognize that food stability is vital to the health and security of all people and implement systems to ensure its equitable ownership, distribution, and advancement. The growing and distribution of core food products such as vegetables, fruits, grains, nuts, beans, and others are publicly owned, usually through national or continental models. Um, regional and global production models may be supported but are not isolated, so we want to avoid catastrophic failure. So what do I mean by that? So we wouldn't just say, okay, America is the only place we're going to grow corn because if there's a plague or you have locusts or who knows what could happen, um, we don't want to set the world back. However, um, regional and global models do give us an opportunity to be much, much more efficient, especially if we're thinking globally with our food production. Now, these higher forms of cooperation allow for more focused investments in scientific precision agriculture, as well as innovative techniques such as vertical farming. The result is more production for fewer resources, making our collective sustenance better for our planet and our species. In a utopia evolving from a capitalist system like our present day, it's likely that for-profit specialty food production still exists in this rudimentary utopia, right? So for example, your celery and tomatoes may be free or very low cost because of the public ownership model. However, if you're buying a Beyond Burger, that may still exist as some sort of profit or incentive driven market because it is a private innovation. Rudimentary utopias allow for the simultaneous exploration of social and individual verticals within a society. In a scenario where especially food products like the Beyond Burger become deeply integrated into the human diet, let's say everyone's eating Beyond Burgers all the time, 
then the participants within a utopia of any form really can regulate it to an, a public ownership model. Again, it's, it's the idea that change changes. Once we have something that becomes ingrained in our society, we must adapt. Rudimentary utopias remove the burden of secure housing from the population by providing socialized housing options for the participants. So we can imagine them as moderately furnished two bedroom, one bathroom units in high rise buildings. But of course, forms will vary. Utopias support these new housing models through the reclassification of housing assets using new laws to split homes into two categories, private and social. The houses are provided at a democratically determined age, uh, always ensuring that the opportunity for revision is available. We would consider social homes permanent residence until the occupants relinquish control. So every person, every person or couple is entitled to one public home under the condition that they have no ownership of any private home. Typically located near the centers of industry, they would offer dignity, comfort, convenience, all while allowing for the efficiencies of scaled services. We already have successful prototypes of this program. Hong Kong has over three and a half million people living in a version of social housing today. Healthcare is the rudimentary utopia program that the United States is really closest to realizing in the present day. It is astounding that the wealthiest, most powerful nation in the world is the only developed nation out of 33 that lacks the will for a universal healthcare system. Participants in rudimentary utopias consider healthcare a right and do not burden their population with the risk of destitution and damage caused by medical issues. Education in a rudimentary utopia is recognized for what it is, the ultimate technology of humanity, one that empowers all other advancements. Public education programs are well-funded, they're widespread and continuously improved. Utopian societies recognize the desire to explore is part of what defines us as human beings. The educational systems reflect this understanding, ensuring that access to continuing education is available to anyone at any time. Utopian societies empower participants to change the direction of their lives as seamlessly as possible. Now, one major shift in a utopian society compared to America today is that education is funded nationally or globally. Um, it no longer relies on local municipality taxes. Uh, so if you're not aware, the majority of public school funding in the United States uh, happens uh, through the funding of, of local property taxes. So for example, in my town in New Jersey, 69% of all the property taxes go to fund our public schools. So that's awesome if you live in New Jersey, right? We just, uh, I think in 2019, we were ranked number one in the nation for public schools. Uh, but what if you're born in you know, rural Oklahoma? What kind of education are you getting? What kind of resources do you have? Um, and, and this compounds, right? It's, it, at this point, there are multiple generations of the same family going through subpar schooling compared to their coastal peers. Uh, so that's something that utopias seek to change is an equal and equitable education for all. Now, beyond just financing, the quality and character of education in a rudimentary utopia has evolved as well. Most of us have experienced a similar structure of public school, one whose roots draw from our industrial era. As the nature of our productive work changes, so must our methods of educating. More focus on dialogue between each other and creative problem solving. Instead of learning a wide range of topics, students begin to focus on going deep into the areas of study they most prefer towards the end of their, or you know, probably middle or end of their high school career. The emphasis on memorizing facts and taking tests for ranking purposes gives way to developing creative and competent individuals prepared to challenge the status quo. Utopian societies all rely on interlinking networks. Education empowers them all. Transportation in a rudimentary utopia enters a phase of significant public investment and expansion. We cannot create structures to support a more profound personal freedom if we do not provide ways for people to leave the circumstances that they were born into. Open transportation empowers innovation and collaboration among participants within society. We plan globally 
but we begin nationally and we give everyone the opportunity for broad experience. According to the EPA, transportation is the largest single pollution vertical in the United States. Rudimentary utopias have completed the process of electrifying and automating their transportation infrastructure. Because the entire system runs on renewable energy and batteries, transportation is free and plentiful for everyone. These programs will begin statewide and nationally, extending continentally and then maturing globally before reforming themselves into space. Rudimentary utopias have achieved a system of open access information available to all nationally and are working towards the same globally. The central theme of any utopia is the constant ability to recreate ourselves and the world as need be. So giving more people more access to more quality information is the surest pathway towards experimentation. The ability to connect, to share knowledge and perspective is the defining characteristic of humanity. All of humanity's successes and failures are the result of communication, both of which will be amplified by the expansion of our communications infrastructure. Intertwined with education, the character of communication also continues to evolve. Now, rudimentary utopias address the spiritual aspect of society by developing and acting upon visions that lead us towards new states of being. Hope is not the precursor to action. It is the result of it. In this era of utopian development, the human being is not fully realized, but they understand that their efforts are working towards something more significant. The redirection is a grand unifying vision that transcends the political struggles of the past. The underlying theme is that there is the ability for all of us to live the lifestyle we want to live so long as we are open to others varying their direction. Adopting this shared vision of progress has a profound impact on the people inhabiting basic utopian societies. People begin to reevaluate everything. It becomes a shared passion among the populace. History, science, religion, all of it viewed under a profoundly different human consciousness. The incentive to maintain old narratives which in turn maintain traditional power structures, gives way to a quest for radical truth, deepening our understanding of who we are and who we can become. Perhaps most importantly, but also most abstractly, is the reevaluation of time. In The Singular Universe and the Reality of Time, philosopher Roberto Mangiabera Unger and physicist Lee Smolin argue for a reorientation of the practice of physics concerning cosmology, which is the study of the universe. The book offers a perspective that is presently on the fringe of theoretical physics, but is one that, if adopted, would radically change the way we approach science. The central theme in the book is that change changes, a concept that empowers us to understand that rudimentary utopias, like the ones we are imagining today, are possible. A significant mark of any utopia is the abandonment of the idea that we can ever hope to resist change through policies and institutions. It, it doesn't work. It just creates conflict as we see today. Today in the United States, we hear a lot of talk about innovation economies, policies and projects designed to spur the creative, productive powers of society. We rarely listen to discussions about the cost of attempting to innovate. Modern day America levies a high price on failure for any individual risk taker. I speak from this perspective as a former small business owner, someone who built a business for eight years and then sold it. If I had failed at that business, I would have been in my early thirties and totally destitute. I invested everything in that business to get it started. Um, and you know, the, the price of failure is so grand. It makes us question, how we really incentivize people. Rudimentary utopias have altered their beliefs, understanding that the best way to create perpetual progress is giving people the freedom to try and fail without fear of destitution. These systems are more than just social safety nets. They are a coordinated effort to transform a population into a higher state of being. More people can explore, experiment, and create in more directions than ever before. 
All Earth nations in 2020 are on the pathway towards rudimentary utopia, but exist at different points within the journey. It requires a wholesale reorganization, a, a global cooperative movement, but begins within individual states and communities. The choice to start the work of rearranging society isn't a goal unto itself. Instead, it is the first step towards a broader social vision that is beyond anything we experience today. Mature rudimentary utopias eventually evolve into progressive utopias, societies that are radically and rapidly evolving, eventually expanding their efforts beyond Earth and to the stars. Thank you.